Hello friends, what's happening? Thanks for uh, hanging out, all that kind of stuff. If you're new here, I'm Jim, thanks for stopping by. Today I'm in Luminar Neo, and this is not a tutorial, this is just a collection of tips and tricks and things like that. I often find myself saying something in a video, and then I get comments and people say, well, I didn't know you could do that, or you said this, I had no idea. So I thought, you know, maybe there's some stuff I can put together in a single video and just kind of say, here you go, kind of gift wrap it for you, for lack of a better word. So this is a present, my friends. I hope it helps. This is just bits and bobs, I think they would call it in England, pots and pans, um, stuff, this and that, whatever you wanna call it, describe it however you like. This is a collection of tips that I've just come across in Luminar Neo that hopefully will help you get more out of using the product. So let's get going. Here's the first one. Um, I get questions sometimes, hey Jim, where's the histogram? Why do you have a histogram and I don't? Well, it's because I went to view and I clicked on show histogram. So if I uncheck it, it's gone. And if I click on uh, show histogram, it comes back. That's obvious. What's less obvious is perhaps when you hover over this, you see these two little dots and you're like, what are these dots, man? What are they doing? And what can I do with them? I click them and they turn white and nothing happens. Well, you can also, by the way, at least on a Mac, I think it's on a PC as well, but I'm not sure. If you hit the J key, they go away. If you hit the J key, they come back. So what is it? It basically indicates blown out parts or really dark parts. So I'm going to move this uh, exposure slider all the way to the top and what happens is you get a lot of red so um, the uh, the little dots basically represent areas of the photo that are completely blown out so I hit the J key to activate that or J key to unactivate it hide it if you will but you can see as I lift the exposure more and more of the photos becoming red which basically means more and more of it is basically blown out so it's a good indicator for you as to how well is the light balance well, it also works in the opposite direction. So if I take the exposure all the way down, negative five, you can see anything that's in blue is basically completely black, which means you'll see no detail in that. The opposite, when the bright parts are in red, means you'll see no detail in those because those are blown highlights. So this is basically an indicator of things that you can see uh, in your photo, either highlights that are blown or shadows that are crushed. Either way, they're unusable. So it's a great way to figure that out. Now, while I'm on Develop Raw, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about Smart Contrast. Hey, what's smart about it? Well, it's smart in that it doesn't necessarily have a huge shift in color that often occurs when you are using other contrast tools, including Super Contrast, which I love, and it's great for adjusting the light, but I say all the time, hey, be careful, because changing in contrast uh, can impact color. Smart Contrast, not so much. It has some, but it's mostly about the light. You can see the colors aren't really shifting. The bright stuff gets brighter, the dark stuff gets darker. Hey, that's kind of what contrast is, but the colors are not getting out of whack. Whereas, if I go to super contrast and start moving these things way up here, I'm gonna move that, I'll move that, I'll move that. You can see the colors are completely different. That's what the photo looked like, and, and I'm not making any adjustments here. This is just showing you that um, super contrast will impact colors because it operates like a traditional contrast tool in that regard. It's just that it gives you control of the different tonal areas. Whereas smart contrast over here in develop, smart contrast doesn't have that huge shift in color. Okay, on to the next tip, and that is in the color section of Develop Raw, you probably know you have these drop down options, you have a dropper, and you have temperature and tint, and all that. Um, on the dropper, you get this stuff, and, and you know, like, oh, I get it, I'm gonna pick a target neutral, and yeah, it's trying to tell you, hey, I can adjust the temperature and tint for you, Jim, if you pick a target neutral. You tell Luminar that's the target neutral, it will adjust this white balance for you. Well, this looks kind of target neutral, I mean, it's kind of white, so I click it, well, that made it kind of yellow. I don't, I don't really want it yellow. Let's try a different one. Let's go over here and try try something. That that now looks kind of like a target. Now looks kind of neutral. I'm just uh, obviously making it up. Hey, a little too blue. Well, here's the thing. There's a way to predict what it's going to be, right? Um, so let me explain that to you. If you look, there's three. If you look, I can't get my mouse there because my mouse is the dropper right now. But if you look in that square where it says pick a target neutral at the bottom, there's an R and there's a G and a B with a number next to it. Red, green, blue, RGB. 
A target neutral is um, when those three numbers are either identical or really close to being identical, you then have a target neutral, right? So let me give you an example. There's a section right over here. Yeah, look at that. Red is 188, green is 187, blue is 189. Basically, it's the same number, right? That's a true target neutral, which means if I click that and I say that's target neutral, there's not gonna be a shift in the temperature intent. If you look on the right-hand side over there, the temperature is 4657 and the tent is four. I'm gonna go ahead and click this and we went to 10 of zero and 4641 instead of 4647. So because they were almost exactly the same, there was no shift. Now let me show you if I pick something different that has a different dominant color instead of those three being equal, I pick one that has a dominant color. Well, look at this. Red and green are both, you know, kind of close, but blue is a whole lot higher. So if I tell Luminar that's a target neutral, well, what I'm saying is, that neutral is super blue. So in order to really balance out the t uh, the temperature and tint here, the, uh, the color or white balance, um, I need to go away from that heaviest number, which is blue, which means opposite of blue is gonna be yellow. So when I click that, hey, my photo gets really yellow. Let me show you another example. If I come over here to the red, if you look, red is 139, green and blue are lower, so it's a dominant red, but if I'm telling it it's neutral, it needs to go away from red. Opposite of red is more cyan, so I'll click on that, I get a more cyan photo. So just keep that in mind. That is a way to kind of predict what's gonna happen when you click on that dropper and pick different areas to get the white balance correct. I still personally just prefer to move the temperature and tint sliders only because I've been doing it kind of my whole life. Um, but that's a good thing to be aware of is that dropper does give you, give you some clues about what's gonna happen. So it's not just randomly, uh, let me pick that. No, I didn't like that. Let me pick that. Uh, I didn't really like that. Let me pick this. Uh, I don't really like that. You know, it's not like that at all. You can kind of predict what's gonna happen based on the numbers in the bottom of that little section. Okay, here's another tip, Structure AI. It's human aware. It doesn't mess with human faces. Hey, that's fantastic. Maybe I have a portrait and I wanna get some crunch in the background. Well, I'm gonna drag this, but you know, hey, I was a little afraid because I was afraid that Structure AI was gonna mess up the face of this person. And guess what? It didn't. I just dragged it to 100 with boost of 100 and look at her face. This is my daughter when she was like eight, but there's her face before and there's her face now essentially untouched. Now the wall looks like crap. So does her hat and all that. I would never do this. But Structure AI is human aware, so you can use it on portraits. It's gonna impact non-human things. It could impact their clothing. It can impact the background. It's unlikely to impact their face. Okay, I mess with color all the time. I love playing with color. Sometimes colors aren't really what I want them to be. You can change colors, it's easy. You actually go into the color tool and you go to hue shift. And if you have this red cup, you can just drag this hue shift. If I could get a hold of it, there we go. And you drag this around and it will change the color of that cup. Hey, I like that. And then all I do is I go into masking, I get my brush and I basically get a bigger brush and I'll just paint this in. So what I'm doing is painting that hue shift into the cup. Now that's now gonna change it and it doesn't impact the rest of the photo. Now in this case, the background was black. The background wasn't gonna change anyway because there's no color in black that would have been affected. You can do this on any photo. The only trick is you gotta be super precise with your masking. But I've had people say, how do I change a color of something? Well, that's how you come into hue shift. You roll the hue around until you find the color that you want. And then you get a mask and you brush it in specifically and slowly. And I recommend zooming in and doing small brush strokes. I use this as an example because I'm going really quickly and I knew the black background wasn't gonna be impacted, but I had a red cup and I now have like a light blue kind of teal cup. Quick and easy, but again, in real life, on a regular photo, you can do that. Just take your time, mask it in slowly. Okay, here's a similar idea to the last one and that is, hey, maybe I wanna do a uh, isolated color, a spot color, whatever you wanna call it. Basically, a black and white photo with one color visible in the photo. So I go into black and white, I click convert to black and white, and of course this photo turns black and white. But I really like that red door because if you look at it, that's pretty cool. Hey, there's only one thing that's red in this photo. Why don't I just go to saturation and add back the red? 
Well, there's red in the yellows, there's red in some of the tiles in the streets, some of the buildings, so that doesn't really work. But you can go into masking and you can go into the brush and then you can click on erase and you can come over here and basically just erase the black and white from the door in order to make that a red door and everything else be black and white. Now, I'm gonna do this real quickly and sloppily so we're all friends here, don't hold it against me. You, you now have a red door However, again, just like the last one, you're gonna to have to be specific and tidy with your masks and take your time. You can do this in Luminar, but, and depending on the subject, you might be able to isolate it with Mask AI. But just FYI, if you wanna do a specific targeted color, only one color in one spot and everything else black and white, you can do it this way. Again, requires some precise masking and a slow, steady hand, but sure, you can do that. Okay, here's another one, and this is about the vignette tool. So as you probably know, you can click Choose Subject and come in here and pick, let's say, right there as the center of your vignette. And then when you adjust the amount and the size and the inner light, it uses that area as the center of the vignette. So the look of the vignette on your photo will adjust accordingly. Now, but did you also know you can click Choose Subject and then not click it again to lock it in, but instead just do these kind of things and then just click around and adjust the center of the vignette based on uh, the fact that you haven't yet chosen the subject. So that's one thing. The second thing is there are times when what I really wanna do is just brighten up a little area of the photo. I don't want a vignette. What I want is inner light, but I don't want a vignette. Well, here's the thing. I can't get to inner light unless that I use the vignette, right? Well, not really, you kinda can. All you gotta do is click on a mount and start to move it, and it doesn't even go past zero, which means there is no vignette, but hey, all of a sudden, inner light is activated. And now I can click on inner light and apply that in my photo, and I can also choose the subject, which I want down here, and that is where the inner light is being focused, and I'm not getting a vignette in the photo because I'm at zero. Okay, in Sky AI, I sometimes get the questions like, hey, I wanna load my own skies, or I bought a sky pack, maybe you bought my sky pack. There's a link below if you'd like to check it out. No pressure, of course, but um, hey, I loaded my sky pack in Luminar. You can do that too if you have sky packs. And in fact, you can get to it in, uh, if you go to show custom skies, it'll pop up in, in, on a Mac, it's like all this stuff. But anyway, there's custom skies, and I have 25 skies in my sky pack. I just dropped them in there, and I can pull them out if I want to. I've added them, so now when I click on sky selection, I can click on this custom, and what it does is it shows me my sky pack. So I have visibility to all my skies right there, so I can come in and say, you know, this sky looks pretty fantastic. I think I'll add sky eight into this photo, and boom, there it is with the reflection but it's a great way to just have them all handy. The only thing I recommend is keep a copy of those skies somewhere else because you never know if there's an update that comes out and you update your Luminar, it may wipe out these skies. I don't know for sure, but it may wipe out these skies because they're not really a part of Luminar. And if you're updating to a new version, it could wipe them out. So always, always keep a backup copy somewhere else. Okay, next little tip is in the LUT tool, and it's called the Mood tool, but I, always, I just call it the LUT tool because it's where you apply LUTs. If you're not familiar with the LUTs, I recommend checking them out. They're kind of like portable presets. I mean, it's short for lookup table, but it basically remaps color and tone values like a preset does, except LUTs work in lots of different products. So you can use them in Luminar, but you can use the exact same LUT somewhere else. So if you use multiple products, hey, this is a great way to carry a look with you from product to product. So you can go and basically, there's a bunch of LUTs built in, but you'll all also notice up here, there's a custom LUT section. So if I click and say, add custom LUT file, I've actually added, uh, I'm working on a, a new LUT pack. I've actually added all of them to Luminar, so they're right here. So I can come in here and just say, you know what I really wanna do? I want a teal and orange look and there it is now that doesn't seem like much but the amount uh, defaults to 30 so maybe I want to go to 100 and get kind of a unique different kind of uh, look maybe I want a sunset look and I want to uh, you know kind of pump that up and again that's at 100 so you can adjust accordingly but you can add custom LUTs into Luminar and they'll stay there for you 
Okay, my last tip, my friends, is about toning, what I like to call split toning, because it's kind of called that in most other products, but split toning or toning in Luminar is basically allowing you to pick a color shade or hue and apply it specifically to the highlights and then pick a separate color hue kind of tone shade and stick that in the shadows. You may know that if you've been here before. So in this case, I might go into the shadows and maybe I want to bump that up a little bit, but my hue is probably going to be a little bit more in the blue. I kind of like my cooler shadows, but I'm going to pop over to highlights and maybe what I want to do is get a little bit of that warmth in the, uh, in the highlights there to get a little bit more of that sunset look. But here's the tip, and that is the amount allows you to apply that accordingly. But something I don't talk about a whole lot is balance. And balance is basically like a scale. It is, hey, do you want more of the shadows color across your image, or do you want more of the highlights color? So if I go to the left, remember, in the shadows, I did blue. The shadows is on the left-hand side. So if I go and take balance to the left, hey, the photo gets more blue, and that's because it's basically tilting more heavily toward the color that I put in the shadows, whereas the opposite is also true. If I go to the right, I'm gonna get a heavier implementation of the color that I put in the highlights. So drag balance to the right, which is the direction of the highlights, you get more of that. And if you go to the left, you get more of the shadows. Also think about a histogram, more to the left is shadows, more to the right is highlights, kind of makes sense. So that plus the amount is a really good way to dial in specifically how you want any kind of split toning or toning usage to apply to your photo. So that's it for these tips, my friends. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this. This is kind of fun for me. Um, I'll probably think of more stuff. Maybe I'll do another video. Um, and if there's anything specifically you want to know about a Luminar that you think I should cover in a future video, boom, you know what to do. Leave a comment for me. And that's it, my friends. Hope you're doing well. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Oh, by the way, check out that video too if you want to learn more about Luminar Neo. I'll see you soon, my friends. Take care, and until then, adios.